This is the Emergency Medical Minute, sponsored by Health One. Emergency Medical Minute and CarePoint hosted a panel on a wide variety of topics. This is Dr. Dave Holland talking about the second psychedelic revolution. So I was kind of surprised when I started writing this lecture because there's a lot of stuff that I don't think we really know that's going on. And so I thought to do this justice, we had to kind of look at the past, uh, the present, and the future to kind of get the whole picture of everything. So let's go through the history here. (laughs) So psychedelics and hallucinogens have been you know, used for thousands of years throughout the Americas, uh, whether it's magic mushrooms or ayahuasca down in Amazon or uh, mescaline. Um, And it's kind of interesting because these are all kind of like pro-social things where there'd be like uh, seasonal changes or puberty rites or, you know, in spiritual uh, issues or kind of healing either from psychological to physical issues. So why did these get such a bad rap? And I guess the, the answer to that is the 1960s. <laughs> so earlier in the decade, these got discovered. They, no one really messed with them. They were just some random compound. And then in the 60s, a guy at Harvard uh, started experimenting with psilocybin. And then in 62, he got fired for giving magic mushrooms to his students. And he started telling people, you know, tune in, turn on, and drop out. And there was a big kind of anti-social backlash from all of this. Um, ecstasy kind of followed in the 70s and 80s, and it shortly got bit banned. And so here's some of the, uh, the, the papers from the 60s. LSD made me a prostitute. Girl gives birth to a frog, and the doctors blame LSD. These are obviously dangerous drugs. And so in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, Nixon launched the war on drugs, the DEA was created, and all of these got listed as a Schedule I, which means highly abusive or high potential for abuse. There's no acceptable medical use for them, and it's not safe to use, even under medical supervision. And it's kind of an interesting list there. Looks CBD is interesting, just got taken off that list last year. And so if you kind of group psychedelics, uh, they kind of put them into three categories. One would be the classics, which is your LSD or acid, mescaline, uh, DMT, which is in ayahuasca, and psilocybin, which is in magic mushrooms. And these kind of, we're not 100% sure how these work yet, but they kind of cause a disorientation of the ego, kind of uh, make you have increased synaptic connections between different parts of your mind. And uh, if it's good, I guess you describe it as blissful, sacred, or mystical. And then there's another category, uh, which is mainly ecstasy or molly or MDMA, which is basically dumps large amounts of serotonin, makes you feel very empathetic, close, takes away fear. And then we have kind of the other categories, and uh, we'll talk more about ketamine since we see that pretty regularly and use it. And so the classics, um, it interacts with serotonin, dopamine, and glutamate, but we're not 100% sure how it works. You also get the sympathetic effect with the big pupils, uh, hypertension, tachycardia, may have elevated temperature. And so the good uh, trip, I guess, would be a heightened perception of sensory input, uh, euphoria, sense of well-being, kind of mystical experience. Uh, Bad trip might be fear, panic, frightening things that you're seeing, uh, feeling like you're going to die. You may be acutely psychotic, could unmask schizophrenia. I think the technical term is tripping balls here. (laughs) So this is interesting because this is uh, just some chemical structures, but you can see that these kind of look like serotonin. So this is probably why, part of the reason why they're working on your brain. This is a uh, diagram of some neural networks. And if you look at each little color, that's a different part of the brain. So maybe one of those areas is your visual cortex. And you can see that they're mostly talking in between themselves, but a little bit of crosstalk. And this is someone who had magic mushrooms. And you can see that now everything's talking with everything. So you can see how this would make you feel a little crazy. This is a functional MRI looking at the uh, visual cortex, and this is the bottom row is somebody that's taken acid, and now they're seen with their entire brain, basically. So let's talk about some of these individual things. LSD, it's measured in micrograms, really potent, usually comes on a blotter tab, 
and it can last fairly long, six to 12 hours. Usually you're not gonna see severe symptoms, but if you get more than 400 mics, it can cause cardiovascular collapse and hyperthermia. DMT is uh, the active ingredient. You might have seen like a Netflix show on ayahuasca. Um, it's a kind of like LSD, just a, they've actually synthesized this and it's a short, short on, short off, uh, can be very intense. And then this ayahuasca, they're still doing this down in the Amazon and it uh, can last a long time, sometimes even days. Mescaline, uh, this is what's in peyote cactuses. And basically people will dry these little, they'll call them buttons, but they'll dry out the cactus tops. Uh, they call it LSD's little brother, not quite as intense as LSD, and lasts, uh, you know, half a day as well. And then psilocybin, this one's especially timely. Um, basically, this is, psilocybin is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. There's dozens of these species that grow naturally up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, usually one to two grams is a normal dose, and it lasts four to five hours. And in May... Denver became the first city in the U.S. to decriminalize magic mushrooms. So uh, this was interesting. It's still not legal to buy or sell these. Um, and then some stats I found of between 2016 and 2018, there's only 11 arrests for magic mushrooms out of 9,000. So at the end of this year, the mayor is going to appoint an 11-person committee to study and write the recommendations for public safety, public administration, public health, and fiscal impacts of decriminalization. Um, so, so, I don't. Arrested, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we can talk about this in, but you, we'll we'll talk about whether we think this will have an impact on us. Um, I guess you still have to buy off the black market, or you can buy spores legally if you know how to grow your own mushrooms. We are on a quest to provide the world with free medical education. Please help us out by rating us on iTunes, following us on social media, and subscribing to our newsletter at emergencymedicalminute.com.